Okay, um, is the screen now uh, visible? Wait, Can ma'am. Wait, go? 30. And then one minute, you wait, ma'am. Oh, one minute. Because okay. some people come at sharp 30. Okay. Okay, uh, is the screen visible and am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Take care. So we'll start one of the uh, most important uh, topics in surgery that happens to be the breast. So uh, first we will have a look at the brief anatomy and the surgically important points that are necessary to understand uh, uh, concepts regarding the breast, okay? So we know that uh, breast is modified sweat gland, correct? So it yes. is modified apocrine sweat gland. So uh, uh, the breast is, okay, I'll just draw a brief, uh, what do you call a diagram? Let's mm -hmm. understand. So this is the pectoralis major. Okay. And there is this retromammary space with the pectoralis fascia. This is the retromammary space. And the red one is the pectoralis fascia. And over that, we have the breast. Okay. This is the nipple areola complex, right? And extending from this fascia to the skin, we have the suspensory ligament of Cooper. Okay. This is nothing but the anterior extension of the fascia attaching uh, anteriorly to the skin. Okay, so this is known as the ligament of Cooper. Okay, Ashley Cooper, or also called as the suspensory ligament. The importance of this we will, uh, you know, study while we are doing the uh, carcinoma breast. Okay. So now the breast, if you see the components, okay, first you have the skin, as you can see here, the nipple areola complex. And then here you have the convergence of 15 to 20 lactiferous ducts, okay. There are 15 to 20 lactiferous ducts. Okay, so these ducts, they have this something called as a lactiferous sinus, which is just a dilatation in this duct. And then basically, it is all the continuation of the lobules. So you have lobules, which is nothing but the glandular components. Okay, this is the actual structure of the breast. Fine. So you have the lobules, okay, mm. the terminal uh, lobular unit, then you have your lactiferous sinus and the lactiferous duct and the nipple areola complex is this clear so when uh, yes ma'am okay now we know the structures right so these lactiferous ducts the tubules all of this the lining epithelium of that the epithelium the lining epithelium of the ducts and the skin is derived from the ectoderm okay so initially we'll just talk a little bit about the development 
right so it is developed from the ectoderm Perfect. and then in yes in between the ducts what do we have all the space here filled with it's all fat okay yes. and fibrous tissue that's called the stroma okay which is made up of fat and fibrous tissue so this is developed from the mesenchyme mesenchyme so we have the ectodermal component as well as the mesenchyme now one important point regarding the development is if you see the human body okay and uh, there is something called as the milk line which extends from the axilla and goes up to the groin okay this is called the milk line fine this is the ridge in humans okay we have a pair of breast which develop in this region okay the rest of this area the ridge is going to regress it's going to regress elsewhere okay now let's say its persistence will lead to the development of accessory nipple if you find axillary nipple it will always be along the milk line okay you must check in the axilla okay and you must check along the milk line up to the groin if at all it's present it will be in along the milk line and nowhere else okay and the breast tissue will develop at around 5 weeks of gestation okay in the in the developing uh, embryo at 5 weeks of gestation there is development of the breast tissue that is you have the ectoderm differentiating and the mesenchyme forming the stroma okay and the uh, after this at puberty there is proper development okay so at puberty let's say around the age of 10 years okay the there is development of the glandular as well as the stromal component of the breast where there is increase in the volume of the breast correct that's a, about that and then the nipple development as such will occur somewhere at the age of 12 years okay that is in brief about the development of the breast okay now we will go and look into the uh, gross anatomy of the breast okay what is the extent of the breast so you know that if this is the clavicle and uh, here you have the second rib okay if this is your manubrium sternae here and uh, this is where you have your the second rib so the breast extends from the second rib above and it goes up to the sixth, sixth rib. rib correct yes so extend here midline you have the sternum this is the medial most limit and laterally it goes up to the mid axillary line okay so this is where exactly the breast is placed okay now the nipple roughly actually it corresponds to the fourth intercostal space if you see the nerve supply to this is from the fourth intercostal nerve correct but the position of the nipple is not very constant it depends upon the person in male you can take uh, it as the fourth intercostal space but uh in case of women if the breast is pendulous and uh, you know old age then the nipple will be shifted downward so no, uh, don't always take the position of the nipple uh, as the fourth intercostal space if you're searching for it clinically count it correct do you get it yes sir okay uh next that's about the extent Fine. Now, what are all the structures? We know the lo uh, the lobules that are there, the lactiferous ducts, the sinuses, which is already been described, and also about the suspensory ligament of Cooper. Correct. Now, let's study about the arterial supply. Very, very important arterial <laughs> supply. Probably this was one of the uh, what do you call the favorite question that uh, examiners asked during our first prof. So. before i go into the blood supply we we'll need to revise up a little bit of anatomy okay talking about the axillary artery do you remember this okay yes ma'am so axillary artery is a continuation of 
sorry, the subscapularis. Okay, because here you have the scapula, and in this fossa you have the muscle. So this is the nerve to the subscapularis. Is that fine? I know the picture is not very good, but it is just to give a perspective. Okay. Yes, sir. Fine. So let's just clear all this mess. Let's just write it here. So. Uh -huh. So from top, we are getting the thoracoacromial artery. Then we're getting the lateral thoracic artery, correct? And then medially, you have this is your sternum, correct? Here you have the internal mammary artery, which is directly coming from your subclavian artery. This is called as the internal mammary artery. So it is going to provide the perforators. Okay, you're going to have three to four perforators, which is supplying from the medial side. Okay. So what was this? And what was this? Lateral thoracic. Yes, lateral thoracic artery, thoracoacromial Thoracal. artery. This should, this should be going in your notebook. This picture will just give you brief of whatever we have studied so far. Okay. And sometimes you also have the posterior intercostal arteries. Okay, because the ribs, na, so they come from posterior to anterior. You have to some extent the posterior intercostal arteries coming from the lateral side. Is this clear? Yes. Sir. This is about the arterial supply. Now the veins will correspond the arteries. Correct? Now, one point that is important to be understood is that the venous drainage from the posterior intercostal, uh, let's say the veins, okay, will go back, correct? It will go along the rib, correct? It goes back. Here you have the vertebra, correct? And they uh, take part in what is called as the venous plexus there, okay? Venous plexus. That is called anybody? The posterior vertebral venous plexus are called Bedson's plexus. Okay, very important is the Bedson's. Have you heard about? Have you heard of this term before? No ma'am. Have you heard of this term? No. Okay. So this is a very frequently asked question. In fact, okay, the venous drainage from the breast will go posteriorly. Okay, through the intercost posterior intercostal vein, and and it forms plexus. Okay, uh, at the uh, vertebral level, and that plexus is called Bateson plexus. Now, one very important clinical point, okay, as to why I mentioned is that let's say there is carcinoma breast. Okay, someone has a tumor growing here. Okay, these cells will go into the venous drainage when there is vascular invasion. The cell will very easily go and metastasize to the thoracic vertebra. vertebra. So now you know what is the root of uh, metastasis, correct? Through the posterior intercostal veins and the Bateson's plexus, the uh, breast, breast cancer will metastasize to the thoracic vertebra, correct? Now you'll never forget. Yes, sir. Okay, fine. Now, a little word about the lymphatics as well. I'm taking your slide for that. Fine. So, if this is the breast, again, we have two group of lymph nodes, which is very, very, very important. If I give the perspective again, here you have your clavicle, here is your sternum, okay? And here you have your axilla. Okay, axilla is a pyramidal shaped uh, uh, space, right? This is your axilla. Apex is pointed towards the clavicle. Here you have a group of lymph nodes which are known as the axillary lymph nodes. Axillary lymph nodes. And here you have a group of lymph nodes which are known as the what could this be called? So that's it. Yes, internal memory because we have the internal memory artery. Yes, so they are, they are nothing but the internal memory lymph nodes. So now the breast is going to drain majorly into this. Around Excellent. 70, yeah, 
75 to 90 percent will drain to the axillary okay and the rest around 20 to 25 percent will drain to the internal mammary logically if there is a tumor which is the uh, lymph node which will most commonly be involved the axillary group of lymph nodes correct yes okay now again axillary lymph nodes are divided one anatomically to uh, the pathological classification so if i must say have you do you remember your clinical examination of the axillary lymph nodes while well, you check taking a, a ca breast case or lump in the yes, breast sir. case okay yes. so we know that we palpate one that is the anterior group so anterior group how will you palpate what is the structure which is a landmark pectoral isthmus yes so this is the anterior fold of the axilla which is formed by your pectoralis major muscle fine you have to go behind and palpate that so there you are going to find your anterior group posteriorly is the posterior axillary fold formed by which yes, muscle sir. formed by which muscle latissimus dorsi latissimus dorsi very good okay then okay posterior group khatam then we go to the central group central group is found within the fat planes of the axilla apical is uh, do you remember do you know what is this what is this? It is the apex of the triangle. Yes, sir. Apex of your axilla. Correct. Now, the apex of the axilla, what do you think it is formed by? See, apex, if you see this, the inlet, the, what do you call the thoracic cavity from the top, okay, you're going to have the, this is, let's say, the first rib, the lateral border of the first rib over here. Anteriorly, you have the clavicle. Posteriorly, you have the superior part of the scapula. Am I right? Okay, this mm -hmm. you're seeing from the top. This is right side of the patient. Okay, and this is the lateral side of the patient. This is the medial side of the patient. This is your first rib, the first rib. Okay, here you have the clavicle. Here you have the scapula. So this is the apex. The nodes that are present at this point, this place, are the apical lymph nodes. Fine. Very difficult to palpate. Agreed. But you need to put your hands. Have, have, has your professor told you need to put your hands as, uh, you know, um, inwards as possible to palpate the apical group? Okay. But still, if yes. they're not enlarged, it cannot be appreciated clinically. So, the central group, you go a little deeper and upwards, you'll find the apical group. And laterally, it is against your head of the humerus okay fine uh, you're going to palpate against the humerus bone am i clear yes sir so we know how to examine these groups okay so this will normally the tumor cells will uh, or the breast is drained by the anterior and posterior equally these two will drain into central okay and some amount of it will even go to the lateral and all of this will drain into the apical. Fine. Anterior, posterior, central, lateral, all of them will ultimately drain into the apical group. Okay. Yes, sir. Now, uh, let us just have a look at the pathological. I told you there's one more classification. They're called as levels. Level 1, okay, level 2, and level 3. This is what we are going to use in case of CA breast, carcinoma breast. Okay. Again, the levels are with respect to a muscle, which is your pectoralis minor. Again, so this is your pectoralis minor. Again, very similar to that, uh, what we studied in the artery. We are going to say things that are lateral to the muscle, behind the muscle, and medial to the muscle. So, in res with respect to the artery, if you remember, the first part was medial to the muscle, correct? And third yes. part was lateral to the muscle. Clear? Now, yes. with respect to lymph nodes, it's exactly opposite. Level 1 is the lymph node that is present lateral to the lymph node, uh, the muscle. Okay? Level 2 is behind the muscle. 
level 3 is medial to the muscle. Is the point clear? Logically, this is the order because the drainage is so. Okay. So your drainage is, comes like this. This is the flow. And artery, the blood flow was like this. So this will be logically 1, 2, 3. Now the logic here is 1, 2, 3. Okay. Never ever get confused. Fine. But the reference is the same muscle which is pectoralis minor. And uh, there's a one thing that I want to mention here. There's a special word known as the rotter's node. Has anyone heard of this name? Rotter's node? No. Okay, it's also called as the interpectoral node. Interpectoral nodes. So what happens is, it is present between your pectoralis major and minor. Interpectoral. Okay, these nodes are known as rotter's nodes. Sometimes when the tumor is too big, okay, very malignant and uh, spreading rapidly, then these nodes are also involved. Okay, again, the importance of these levels will be dealt in the staging of CA breast and the uh, treatment aspect of CA breast. Fine. Okay, so now we have done the anatomy. Now we will move on to the physiology of the breast. It's uh, pretty simple. You guys will tell me the physiology. Correct. Breast is subjected to two hormones, two important hormones. These are estrogen and progesterone. Okay. You should know what these two hormones uh, do to the, uh, to the breast. See, estrogen is basically going to cause the proliferation. There is proliferation of the duct system. Okay, there's increase in the number uh, of the ducts. That is what estrogen is going to do. What will progesterone do? This helps in the uh, increase in the size of the glands. Okay. Now, uh, let's say in uh, uh, puberty. Okay, there is increase in the estrogen. That's when there is proliferation of the duct system and stroma and there is increase in the volume of the breast. Agreed? Okay. Then, second is when there is cyclical changes, that is during the menstrual cycle, right? We have two phases. If this is the ovulation here, okay? Here you have the uh, follicular phase and here you have the luteal phase, fine. Here the predominant hormone is the estrogen. Present. Here the predominant hormone is progesterone. So during the first part of the cycle, there is proliferation of the ducts. In the second part, there's increase in the size and the maturation of the ducts. Once the menstruation, there's a flow here. There is a uh, loss of the endo, uh, what do you call the lining and all the estrogen progesterone go back to the normal values. There is involution. There is regression of the breast. It will go back to its normal phase. So this happens during every menstrual cycle. Fine. Now let's say the, uh, the lady gets pregnant. So what happens during pregnancy? There is sustained increase in the estrogen and progesterone. Both are high. Agreed. Now there is yeah. both proliferation and maturation and is the breast size will go on increasing during pregnancy. Okay. Sometimes it becomes double the normal size and there's hyperpigmentation of the areola. Right. Now, once she gives birth, okay, there is loss of estrogen progesterone. Again, the involution phase will start. Okay. In lactation, Okay, during lactation, what happens? There is production of something called as the prolactin. So this hormone is going to increase the milk production in the glands. Fine. And now we have just produced the milk in the breast, but it has to be let out. Correct? Ejected. It means yes. So what is the hormone that's re uh, responsible or required? Very important. Yes. Oxytocin. oxytocin. So where does this oxytocin act? What are those cells called? 
the cells which line the ducts but still do the squeezing activity okay it is in the term that is myoepithelial cells epithelium because they form the lining myo because it is having some amount of contractile activity right and oxytocin is necessary for its action okay and what you, what happens after menopause is that there is no estrogen there is no i mean no it, i can't say no but there is minimal uh, levels of the estrogen and progesterone hormones so hence the uh, the breast will undergo involution or regression so now the breast will be replaced by what fibrous tissue fine there is fibrosis and fat degeneration degeneration okay this is the simple anatomy and physiology including the embryology aspect of the breast okay now let us move on to the examination of the breast fine right? i think we have the enough uh, background to start with the surgery topic proper okay so let's suppose you are sitting in the opd okay surgery opd and a patient comes to you saying she has she is palpating a lump in the breast okay we will see the different scenarios okay and the uh, presentations but i'm just giving you situation now in a case like this what is it that you have to do what do you think you should do first are you guys with me am i fast or am i slow yes ma'am okay i'll continue with the same speed yes ma'am okay see when the patient comes to your opd the first thing okay in the matter in yes first is you have to take the history first is history taking in a case like this i'll tell you what is the importance of history okay after that you are going to examine the patient examination clinical examination fine this is also very important then based on these two you are going to order some investigation this is normal for any case correct and then finally you are going to go with the sure uh, diagnosis for sure diagnosis you need a tissue biopsy or tissue study now for breast uh, cancer there is a term which is known as triple assessment yes sir what are the components of triple assessment history clinical history. examination is history one component examination yes ma'am yes and two imaging this is and biopsy imaging. very good and three is biopsy so these history are the three components of yeah these are the three components of triple assessment and if you follow all the three steps the chances of getting your 99, diagnosis 99. right is very good so this is the accuracy so this is how that's why you need to follow all the three steps meticulously so we'll talk about the first step which is the history now if you normally take case what do you start with name okay fine age and sex what is the importance of age with respect uh, to see yeah. breast uh, late age is more prone to carcinoma exactly so increase in the age will increase the risk of ca correct and again sex if you are palpating a lump in the male breast if there is enlargement and stuff like that so it will increase your suspicion of uh, what do you call a familiar or a hereditary condition because normally uh, breast cancer is not seen in males correct but that doesn't say that doesn't mean that it is not seen at all it is uncommon but it can still occur okay yes next we'll take the history about the residents and their socio economic status why is this important see ca breast is I common said, in i said social economic status is more prone to very good very good so the western countries where there is high socio economic status okay 
the lifestyle fine and things like habits like alcohol consumption high fat diet and obesity correct so these are the risk factors so history needs to be taken regarding all of this fine so next you will go in take the chief complaint correct what is her chief complaint now i just told you just come with the complaints of lump in the breast what all things will you ask lump in the breast for this see first you are going to take it gradually increasing or not first is the duration how long has it been there is it been there since one month three months one year two years so important is the duration because acute onset you will think of some inflammatory condition or a galactoria correct could be an abscess mastitis but if it is a long term yeah mastitis correct but if it is a long term condition okay long standing insidious progressive okay initially painless now become painful then you it will raise the suspicion of a malignancy correct first is duration and then how did she notice it okay is it through self breast examination which will be the case in educated women but if it's from a village or something she is going to say i noticed it while taking bath okay or um while wearing the dress or something like that okay so how did she notice this is also important then about the size how has it progressed okay how how much was the size when she first noticed it and now what is the size is there a gradual increase or a sudden increase right and is it associated with pain very important normally if it is carcinoma that is it will not be associated with pain if there is associated pain then you have to ask about the type of pain okay the degree of pain is it mild moderate severe and about the cyclicity okay whether it is going to increase and decrease corresponding to the menstrual cycle okay then that term what we use is called as cyclical nostalgia nostalgia is painful breast condition now the pain all the cyclical nostalgia is suggestive of a benign breast disease normally carcinoma will not have pain but there are exceptions but normally and that too it will be some kind of a fibro cystic disease which is commonly associated with cyclical nostalgia okay we'll take up the discussion of benign breast disease in the next class okay we'll deal about it in more detail okay fine so now you take the history of pain okay what else will you ask what other history will you ask positive family history very important so it is the family history okay before we go to family history something uh, in this only if you want to ask any other lumps you want to ask other lumps okay regarding the lump itself then we'll go to family history other lumps as in if there's another lump in the contralateral breast or lump in the uh, swellings in the axilla okay so that will tell you about the bilaterality of the disease or because see fibroadenoma can be bilateral correct yes sir even ca breast can be bilateral but that's pretty rare and if you are having a swelling in the uh, axilla if she has noticed and come it might be suggestive of the already spread of the disease to the axillary lymph nodes lymphatic correct yes lymphatic spread then what else will you ask a uh, history of weight loss for any carcinoma if you are suspecting carcinoma you should always take history of weight loss and history of loss of appetite okay because cancer cachexia right can be seen in any of the cancerous conditions and it is important weight loss and loss of appetite then any history for uh, you know to rule out metastasis so the breast cancer where all can it metastasize we told it can go to axilla correct fine that's lymph nodes i'm talking about metastasis 
brain metastasis meaning it can go to brain we just discussed one through bates and plexus it can go to thoracic vertebra the vertebra yes sir yes thoracic vertebra so metastasis it can go to the bones first bones right. so bones so you should ask for history of bony pains history of bony pains history of chronic back ache okay then history of headache if there is bone uh, you know metastasis to the brain okay headache history of seizures okay then if it is metastasized to the abdomen it can go to the liver then you should ask about abdominal mass or ascites or abdominal pain okay so these all will uh, direct the examiner okay you, his your examiner will get to know that you are ruling out the things and you are come, arriving at a diagnosis so at the end of your history na you must already have a provisional diagnosis right is it clear yes ma'am now you will go on to the next part that is the family history we have finished the hopi correct now we are seeing the family history so family history as you said you should ask about the history of similar lumps or history of ca directly you can go and ask okay history of any carcinoma in the first or the second degree relatives this is very important first or second degree relatives fine then what else will you ask any history of hormonal replacement therapy very good then comes our drug history so in drug history you are going to ask the intake of ocps intake of hrt that is hormone replacement therapy okay and what else there could be any other exogenous estrogens or hormones that the patient might have taken correct so now there is a recent study which says ocps will not really raise the risk of ca breast mm. remember this why so see the dose if you check out the dose of estrogen and progesterone in the fourth generation in the fourth the generation contraceptives yes they're extremely low it's very less less concentration is used and they will not have much effect on the uh the breast tissue fine so ocps are not really risk factor but provided you take for more than 10 years continuously then it might have some amount of increased risk okay but if they ask you should say no but hrt is hormone replacement therapy is a known risk factor that too the effect will start after 2 years of treatment initial 2 years nothing will happen the effect will start only after 2 years of treatment and there is significant increased risk so in these people what you do you will have to keep uh, what you call annual um, examination annual screening you need to keep screening these patients fine and in these patients it is going to increase the risk of ca breast correct and estrogen if you know will also increase the risk of ca ovary agreed and also increase the risk of ca endometrium if you remember uh, your pharmacology class okay your uh, teacher might have told that increased estrogen will also cause ca endometrium there certain group of drugs like your tamoxifen raloxifen correct your est selective estrogen serums estrogen receptor modulators yes sir correct select estrogen receptor modulators these drugs will act also on your endometrium okay and then there is increased incidence of uh, ca endometrium in those conditions also serums are selective blockers so they block in one place and they do not block in the other place okay we, when we talk about the hormone therapy i'll talk about tamoxifen that is a different case that's a blocker but here it is the estrogen directly you are giving so it will have a proliferative effect on the endometrium as well as the ovary and so increases the overall risk of three cancers what are they breast ovaries and endometrium just remember this 
HRT. Fine. But HRT will reduce the risk of what conditions? Reduces the risk of why have you started them on HRT in first place? One is for the flushes and all those symptoms. Correct. Postmenopausal. Yeah, postmenopausal syndrome. In that, the most important thing is the osteoporosis. It is to address the osteoporosis. So HRT will reduce the risk of osteoporosis and also the it's observed that there is also reduce the risk of colorectal carcinoma. This is also very important. So make this, um, you know, block letter notes that what are the risks that is going to incre increase the risk for certain cancers and the risk for certain cancers is decreased. So make this a very clear note in your notebook. Okay. Is that clear? Drug history. Then, okay, what else? After that, we'll go on to the menstrual history. Very important. Early menopause. Late menopause. So, increased exposure. We'll have a general formula. That is, increased exposure to estrogen will increase the risk for carcinoma. Now, you can go on listing. Tell me what are all the conditions. First is early. Menarche. Menarche. Very good. Next. Late menopause. Once she attains. Yeah. Okay. Late menopause then. Nulliparity. Nulliparity. Okay then. What about her Ash age? Late, late age. Yes. So... Uh, what do you call age at first pregnancy if she gets pregnant at a later um, age okay that's important then what else we have said drugs that is hrt and exogenous drugs what else okay so these are all the uh, exposure okay even uh, p people with pcos okay to some extent uh, hrt Okay, and uh, all these things will affect the uh, former risk factor. Okay. okay, apart from menstrual cycle, what is the next history you're going to take? Coming to the diet history. So, diet history, you're going to talk about the, again, as I mentioned, fatty diet. Okay, and uh, the this one, uh, sm smoking. Actually, I'll tell you one interesting fact here that we have mentioned high fat diet and we have mentioned the alcohol consumption but surprisingly smoking is not a risk factor but smoking is a risk factor almost for almost all cancers but not for c and breast okay and there are certain studies which say that people who are on night shifts Okay, they do a night shifts now. These people will have decreased melatonin. Correct? Melatonin is a sleep hormone. Na? Yes. So they have decreased melatonin. This also will increase the risk of CA breast. Okay. So this point is actually scary because we have like really obscured uh, schedules, duty schedules. So I just found it very interesting, so I felt like sharing it with you. So night shifts will also increase the risk, they say. Okay. Fine. So this is in brief the history. Okay. And in the end, you need to summarize. Okay. What are all the significant parts in your history and give a brief summary to the examiner. Okay. And also for your, yourself, because that is going to simplify your examination. Fine. Now, after this, you are going to go ahead and do the clinical examination, correct? So, you took the history. Now, what will you do? You are going to examine, fine? You are going to make the patient sit, okay, uh, with the uh, adequate parts exposed, that is from the neck till the abdomen, fine? And in the presence of a female attender, very important, known as the chaperone, so if yeah if you're a male uh, doctor then it's very important that you take care of this 
and then you make the patient sit okay and hands on the waist this is the first position for examination now first what you're doing is the inspection so inspection what will you notice quick 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 we can go through this section very fast and start see a breast symmetry okay. yes very important symmetry so if there is involvement of if there is ca breast there will be fibrosis there will be uh, what do you call um, the breast will be pulled towards the direction correct so there will be asymmetry next then looking at the nipple areola complex you might see that there is mm -hmm. retraction of the nipple and discharge okay? or maybe, yes discharge could be there or deviation of the nipple discharge you have to comment uh, when you go to palpate the breast inspection if at all you're seeing some distance at the tip of the nipple you can but most of it it's at the time of palpation when you can actually express and confirm your uh, observation regarding a nipple discharge is that clear yes ma'am okay fine now the nipple uh, the what do you call the symmetry of the breast then the position of the nipple nipple areola complex retraction fine then if you are able to make out the lump, if you're able to make out the lump, then you can mention if it's too big, you can make out the borders, right? And the uh, skin over the lump, is it smooth or is there puckering, dimpling, purely <clears throat> orange appearance? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Then, then you ask the patient to lift the hand above the head. Then you are going to see the inframammary fold. Okay, inframammary fold, and here you can now appreciate puckering, dimpling if it is present. Fine, and also you have to notice the supraclavicular fullness. If the supraclavicular nodes are also involved, there will be supraclavicular fullness. And then this is all about the inspection. Then you go into palpation. The same findings you're going to confirm palpate the breast lump with the palm of the fingers. Okay, do you understand the term palm of the fingers? It's not by using the tip of the fingers, the palm of the fingers. Right? Try to find the lump, quantify the size, try to make out all the borders. Is it regular, irregular? What is the consistency? Okay, then it's mobility. Is it mobile within the breast or with the breast? Do you understand the difference? This is becoming more of a clinical class. Okay, so what do you mean by uh, the lump is mobile with the breast tissue or mobile within the breast tissue? Is there a difference? Ma'am, benign and malignant differential. Okay, yeah, yeah. So if they say if they say the lump is mobile within the breast tissue, that means that the lump is not adhered to the breast tissue. It is well encapsulated and can be moved around. Example is, best example is? Fibroderma. Very good. Also called as the? Breast mouse. Breast mouse. For this very property. The second one is mobile with the breast tissue. The point here is the lump is adherent to the surrounding breast tissue. That the whole of it has to be moved. Correct? So you're yes, going sir. to talk about that. And very important is the adherence to the chest wall. I have a simple question. Now, if the breast lump is adherent to the pectoralis major muscle, do you consider it as adherence to the chest wall? By definition, will that be adherence to the chest wall? Because why I am saying this is that it will really change the staging of the disease when we will learn the TNM staging and so, far, so on. You will see that this difference is going to make a lot of impact on the prognosis and staging yes ma'am right see when the tumor is adherent to the chest wall we mean it is adherent either to the uh, serratus anterior if it's lateral or the intercostal muscles or the ribs adherence to the pectoralis major is not considered as adherence to the chest wall Am I clear? Make a note of this. Write it in big letters. Mm -hmm. That pectoralis major adherence is not the same as adherence to the chest wall. Fine? Okay. Then, if the tumor is adherent to the pectoralis major, how will you uh, demonstrate that? You should put the muscle in first. Try to move the lump as it is. 
If it is freely moving, that means it is not adherent to the muscle. Correct. Now you put the muscle into contraction. If there is ask, further, ask, yes. Huh. Ask the patient yeah. to hold the hand with uh, adjacent wall. That is for serratus anterior. Correct. Now, if we are talking about the pectoralis major, how will you put the pectoralis major into contraction? You're going to ask the patient to press the hand against the waist. Okay. Yes, if at all you want to uh, confirm my statement, you try to put hands again over your waist, <laughs> press it, and now palpate your axillary fold, anterior axillary fold. Can you feel it? Yes, ma'am. Yes, that means your pectoralis major is in contraction. Now, what you said is pushing against the wall will put the serratus anterior into contraction. That is also important provided the lump is in the outer quadrant. Outer, upper or outer, lower quadrant. Fine? Okay. Okay, so breast is divided into upper, this is median, upper, inner and lower, inner, upper, outer and uh, this is lower outer quadrant. Fine. This is the quadrant system of the breast, just for the clarification. Okay. Fine. So, mobility is done, consistency told. Okay. Fine. Then we have to also talk about the local rise of temperature and tenderness. These are the two important features of palpation, isn't it? Palpation. Yes. Fast. If there is local rise of temperature, erythema, edema with pain, then what will you think? What are these features? Inflammatory. Very good. Very good. So it could be a breast abscess. It could be mastitis. Okay. Or just the cellulitis. Fine. But there is a inflammatory variety of malignant breast condition known as the inflammatory breast carcinoma. Worst IBC. prognosis. Very, very good. Worst prognosis. There is involvement of skin. You're going to have ulcerations. Okay, for all features of inflammation will be there. And most importantly, they will not have a breast lump. It becomes very difficult to differentiate between this and our cellulitis. Fine. So that again, you'll have to do biopsy and so on. We'll discuss it later. Okay. Fine. Palpation is over. Percussion, nothing much regarding breast. But what if at all they're old-fashioned examiners, they might say that you need to percuss on the uh, inner aspect of the breast that is just lateral to your sternum and if you hear a dull note okay that means there is enlargement of internal intercostal sorry the internal mammary nodes okay which is not very clinically appreciable then coming to the auscultation check for the breath sounds are they equal on both the sides now why am i in interested in the breath sounds what do you think is the reason what am i looking for Retrosternal extensor. Retrosternal is for thyroid. Breast has not got anything to do with the sternum. Breast has got nothing to do. If you see the extension of the breast, it is medial to that, no? Yes. It is not, see, when I'm saying breath sounds, I mean I'm interested in the lungs. Correct? Metastasis. See, there is uh, metastasis to the lungs and the pleura. Very important. It is to the pleura. And there is something called as malignant pleural effusion. Fine. So, to rule out the presence of malignant pleural effusion. Fine. So, auscultation, all of our examination is done. And now we have a provisional diagnosis. So, now we are going to go ahead and go for a imaging study. Which is the commonly done imaging study? It's a mammo mammography. mammography, which is nothing but the x-ray of the breast. One mammography is equal to four chest x-rays. That is the exposure. So what? how much is the exposure during one mammography? It is 1.5 milligray. That's the radiation exposure unit. Okay, 1.5 milligray. Now, this is nothing but you're taking x-ray of the breast. Now, you, there are two views. This is the breast. Radiolateral view or craniocaudal view. Very good. So, this is first is the craniocaudal view. The other one is the mediolateral oblique view. Mediolateral oblique view, craniocaudal view. Is this clear? 
in the cranial caudal view what are you visualizing you're visualizing the medial uh, breast tissue medial part of the breast tissue medial aspect or medial part of breast <coughs> is visualized and in the medial lateral uh, oblique view you're going to visualize the maximum breast tissue correct now yes. i have a question here uh, if there are four quadrants of the breast, which quadrant has the maximum breast tissue? This is the medial, this is lateral. Which quadrant out of this will have the maximum amount of breast tissue? And hence, the incidence of CA breast is upper. highest. Upper and outer. Yes. Okay. Upper and upper outer. Is something called Yes, this is called the, what is this? Axillary tail of? Spence. Very good. Axillary tail of spence. So, hence there is maximum amount of breast tissue in the upper outer quadrant. Now, if this is the upper outer quadrant like that, so medial lateral is going to cover the maximum amount of breast tissue and also used to visualize the uh, axillary tail of spence fine these are the two two views that are there now if there is a lump on the uh, mammography you're going to see that this is the breast there's a lump here there's some amount of calcification necrosis or over the necrotic area there is deposition of calcium that is dystrophic calcification correct now, if it is micro calcification, what does it suggest? If there's macro calcification, what does it suggest? Micro is malignant. Yes, so microscopic calcification, micro calcification rather, is suggestive of a malignant etiology. Macro is usually suggestive of a benign Malign. etiology. Here it will appear very, uh, what do you call, irregular. And here it will be uh, almost smooth. Regular margin. Regular margins. That's right. Okay. So now uh, that's about the mammography. Then we have ultrasonography. But this yes. is majorly before, for the benign. Before 35 years. Uh -huh. Before 35 years. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, this is for cystic conditions. You know, USG is for cystic conditions. So, benign diseases where you have the fibrocystic disease, okay, the investigation of choice would be USG. Okay. So, now for screening. For screening, which is the commonly used investigation? Screening for what? Screening for CA breast. Which is the commonly used investigation? We just described. Mammography. Mammography. So, very important. This is mammography. Now, one thing to be understood here is that if the age of the patient is less than 35 years, what happens? The breast is very fibrous. Okay. You cannot visualize the breast. Okay. You will get a lot of shadows and you cannot see. So, that's why you will not go for mammography if the patient is less than 35 years. You usually go for MRI if you have to see something. Or if USG is sufficient, then you'll go with USG. But for patients who are more than 35, the breast, the fibrous content will reduce, okay, and the breast will be more clearly visible. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Huh. So in USG, let's say if the patient also has a lump or a swelling in the axilla, you, you can do USG of the axilla also. Bilateral axilla can also be done. Okay. So now after this, the last step was the cytology, correct? We are going to do the tissue uh, study. So what is that? We, there is something called the FNAC and contrasting that is with true cut biopsy. Have you ever seen uh, your staff or your resident perform these procedures in the ward? Have you guys seen these procedures anytime? No, ma'am. Okay, fine. See, what happens is that if there is, this is the breast, there's a lump here. There is something called FNAC, that is fine needle aspiration cytology. What you really do is you take a needle like this, okay, its size is around 
22 to 26 gauge okay that means it's very fine okay so you have a fine needle and all you do is you stick that needle in and you take it out you just put it in once and take it out whatever tissue that comes in that the tip of the needle you're going to make slide on uh, using those uh, cells that is called fine needle aspiration cytology simple whatever is there whatever is picked up you're going to take that and make the slide right but in true cut biopsy what happens if this is the lump here is your big needle so the size is around 14 to 16 gauge okay here's the opposite smaller the size bigger the bore or the caliber okay you know this now fine bigger the number smaller the caliber i mean the diameter of the needle okay so in true cut what happens we're going to use a wider uh, what do you call a, a bore needle and here we are going to go in and take a chunk of the tissue itself so when we come out we have tissue chunks like this actually it is in the form of ribbons like this so we get tissue chunks like this and then we are going to put this under the microscope and do our uh, staining okay get the histopathological report hpr report from this and also use some part of the sample to estimate or establish the er pr and the her2 new status have you heard of this at least what is er pr her2 new estrogen receptor very good progesterone receptor her2 new what is the full form of her2 new HER stands for human epithelial receptor. So it is nothing but a growth receptor on a cell actually. Okay. So for these, we need a special procedure, which is known as IHC. What is the full form of IHC? It is immunohistochemistry. Immunohistochemistry. Okay, so this is the actual procedure. Now, you can tell me, what is the disadvantage of FNAC? Can, uh, we, can yeah, we get ERPR her to new? No, ma'am. We cannot. Okay, we are getting individual cells. We don't have chunk of tissue so that we can actually do the IHC from this. So, the disadvantage is that we cannot get ERPR her to new. And these are very important to know the prognosis correct whether we can put the patient on hormone therapy or not which we will talk about in the next class and one uh, last point before we disperse is that see this is the basement membrane fine do you remember histology do you remember your histology classes yes, so Yes, if this, I, I feel everybody sleeping because it's 10.30. <laughs> okay, so this is the basement membrane. Okay, over the basement membrane, you have the cells which are light. Agreed? Now, these cells, let's say, will proliferate like crazy. What is cancer? Mal malignancy is uncontrolled cell growth. Agreed? Yes, sir. You have cells growing like this very wild. Now, this, there could be atypia, there could be hyperplasia. You know what is hyperplasia? All these pathology terms. Okay. It hyperplasia. Number of yes. What is atypia? The nuclear Hyper change, which is suggestive of malignancy, bigger nuclei, lack of differentiation, and all that. Okay. Whatever could be the thing, if the basement membrane is intact, that means the tumor has not spread. This is called carcinoma in situ. Is, am I clear? In situ as in it is in place. It is not spread. It has not gone anywhere. Yes, sir. Now, for some reason, okay, let's take the eraser. Okay, for some reason, there is a breach here. Okay. In, now in the basic. tumor cells, yeah, now the tumors have come in. So this is called the invasive carcinoma. Yes, this forms the basis for the next class. Okay. So now the last difference between FNAC and true cut. Can you tell it or should I give it? The clue is in the slide. Ma'am, uh, it cannot penetrate to the inner side in FNAC. 
Okay, in FNAC, what we are doing is we are picking up individual cells. We don't know the status of the basement membrane because we cannot visualize the basement membrane. Yes, right. So, from doing FNAC, can you say if it is in situ or invasive carcinoma? No. No. But can you do that using a true cut biopsy? In true, true cut biopsy, you're taking, let's say, a chunk of tissue like this. Yes, sir. So sorry. Like this. The whole of this tissue is coming. So now you can tell whether it is invasive or in situ. Fine. The, those are the differences between the FNAC and true cut biopsy. Okay. So in the next class, now we have finished till triple assessment. Now let's say we are making a diagnosis of carcinoma. In the next class, we will study what are all the different types. What is carcinoma in situ? What are the types of carcinomas? Okay. And uh, how exactly to diagnose and to go about the treatment and TNM staging. Okay. Yes. Are there any okay. questions? Is this time slot okay or is it too late? Is this time slot easy and you know convenient for you people to attend or should we make it little early? The thing is, uh, we were, I'm just having COVID duties. That's why I couldn't make it early. No problem. This is fine, ma'am. It's fine, no? Okay. Okay, fine. Right then, any any doubts or shall we call it a, an end? No way. Okay then, fine. So read up about this and we'll continue the uh, rest of it in the next class. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Hello, ma'am. Ma'am, I did not realize the call got. Hello, class. Complete. Hello, class.